Moving on, yet more versions of the derivative for scalar fields. In single variable calculus, there were various rules for calculating the derivative. Arguably, the most important of these rules was the chain rule for calculating derivatives of composition. For single variable functions, f and g from r to, r to r, I can compose them and ask for the rate of change of the composition. So what happens to composition with scalar fields? Well, if I have two scalar fields, f and g, they are both functions from r n to r. I literally can't compose them. The output of the first is in r, and the input of the second is in r n. They are not compatible. And this hopefully makes sense. Take two of my favorite examples, temperature and pressure in the atmosphere. I can multiply these two if I wanted at any point, and that makes some sense. But I can't compose them. Doing so would be asking for the pressure of the temperature? That's meaningless. There isn't such a thing as the pressure of the temperature. So there is no is there no composition for scalar fields? Well, not with two scalar fields, but there is a way to choose functions which are compatible for composition. If I have a scalar field, its domain is Rn, or a subset thereof. If I have a parametric curve gamma, its output is also Rn. So I can compose a scalar field with a parametric curve, f compose gamma. What does this mean? Well, a curve is a path in space, and a scalar field is a scalar that depends on points in space. So this composition is the scalar field restricted to the curve. If the scalar is again temperature, then this composition is measuring not the temperature everywhere, but only the temperature of an object as it moves along a particular path. And that seems like a thing worth doing. Let me choose a classic physics example. Potential energy due to gravity, say, is a scalar field I've talked about before, so let me compose it with a parametric curve. Then P compose gamma is the potential energy along a path of movement through space. So what derivative does this have? Well, the composition is actually a single variable function, a function of t, the parameter of the parametric curve. The derivative asks, how does potential energy change as I move along the path in time? Its derivative is not a partial, but an ordinary d over dt. But even though it is an ordinary d over dt, it still goes through a multivariable output of the parametric curve and a multivariable input of the scalar field before the output is the scalar again. So how do I differentiate this composition? What is the chain rule here? Well, I'll state this in R3 instead of the general Rn. F is a scalar field in R3, and gamma is a parametric curve in R3. If there were only one variable, then I could write the chain rule as something like this, the derivative of the outside function, evaluated at the inside function after the derivative was completed, times the derivative of the inside. Well, in several variables, I just do this in each variable and add it all up. The total change is the change in x plus the change in y plus the change in z, all calculated by the chain rule and added together. I now omit the vertical bar notation. The idea is still there. In each partial, I have to evaluate on the curve after I finish, but it is now conventional to hide this idea and just remember that it's supposed to happen. The chain rule is the sum of the individual chain rules in each piece. This is a little abstract, so let me do an example. Here is a scalar field and a parametric curve in R2. Let me calculate the rate of change of this scalar along the movement of this curve. I write the general form. Then I have to calculate the two partials of the scalar field, del f del x and del f del y. I put those into the general form. I also need to calculate the derivative of the components of the curve, dx dt and dy dt. So I calculate those as well and put them into the form. Then I need the replacement step, the step I no longer indicate in the notation. In this step, I take the x and y from the partials and replace every x with the x-coordinate of the curve and every y with the y-coordinate of the curve. 
That's using the original curve coordinates, not the derivative of the curve. Then I get an expression entirely in t, which is what I wanted. Movement along this curve happens in time, which is an ordinary d over dt rate of change, so this expression should be in t. I simplify down and get this polynomial expression. This is how the scalar field changes along this curve. And it is decreasing quite rapidly given the negative signs in front of the larger degree pieces of this polynomial. Finally, let me do a potential energy example. Here is the potential energy due to gravity with a large mass m at the origin in R3 and a small mass m moving around. Say that the smaller mass is moving in a helix upward in the z-axis, using an example curve from the weak unparametric curves. This is moving upward in z, away from the gravitational source at the origin. I expect that the potential energy should be increasing at it as it moves away, but probably at a slower and slower rate, since potential energy is less affected the greater the distance. Let's see if this intuition fits. Here is the general form in R3, with the partials and the curve component derivatives. So I calculate the partials first, then, in the partials, I replace the x, y, and z with the components of the curve. There's quite a bit of algebraic simplification that I've skipped here, but these denominators boil down to 1 plus t squared, all to the 3 halves. The numerators still reflect the components, sine t for x, cos t for y, and t for z. Then I also calculate the curve derivatives, cos t for x, negative sine t for y, and 1 for z. And then I notice that the first two terms of the whole thing put together are exactly the same, except for being positive and negative. They will both have a sine times cosine in the numerator. Therefore, these terms cancel out, leaving only the third term. This term is indeed positive, and since this is the derivative, it shows that the potential energy is increasing. However, as t grows, this derivative becomes smaller and smaller since the denominator has a higher asymptotic order. This tells me that the rate of change gets smaller, matching my intuition. As the object gets farther and farther away, it is only getting potential energy very slowly, since potential energy doesn't change very much for distances far away from the central mass.